folks, thanks for coming along in person and uh, and on the Zoom, uh, where George Williams is going to talk for us. Uh, I'll introduce. He's very well known, but I'll introduce him briefly. George William, Williams is uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of New South Wales and also Professor of Law. He's an author of many, many books, but I think the most important one with reference to this discussion tonight is his 2010 book, People Power, The History and Future of Referendums in Australia, which I think is the only concise history of Australian referendums. And tonight, Professor Williams is going to speak for us on the topic referendums then and now. He'll speak for about 30 minutes. We'll have questions, discussion, finish at the top of the hour. You're very welcome, George Williams. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm particularly delighted to have been invited by the Sydney Institute, which has shown such foresight in choosing this topic for tonight. After, of course, what was such a big weekend at Gama uh, with the Prime Minister's announcement that we will be having Australia's first referendum in 23 years. Now, you will have seen from the weekend that there's tremendous optimism, uh, tremendous hope amongst campaigners that this will be Australia's first referendum success in many decades. However, we also need to acknowledge that uh, referendums present a remarkably formidable challenge in Australia. We need to recognise that some of Australia's most successful leaders electorally, our most successful influences in our history, have also had spectacular failure when it comes to referendums. Think, for example, of Bob Hawke. He won on a wave of popularity in 1983. He put a referendum in 1984 at the height of that popularity and he failed spectacularly. Think also of Robert Menzies. He, of course, our most successful Prime Minister electorally, put one referendum only and that was in 1951 and that was the only referendum he ever put. He was left bitter and disillusioned by his unsuccessful attempt at constitutional change, on that occasion an attempt to give the Federal Parliament the power to ban communism. Menzies went into that referendum with polls showing 80% of the community in support. But in the end, after what he described as an unscrupulous campaign, uh, waged by H.V. Evatt in particular, Australians narrowly rejected Menzies' referendum proposal. Menzies never put another referendum. In fact, he described winning a referendum as one of the labours of Hercules. And indeed, that label has stuck because it aptly describes the difficulty of winning a referendum in Australia. Now, I'm sure here you're aware of the overall statistics. We've had 44 referendums since Federation in 1901, and of those, only eight have succeeded. So a really quite dismal record when you look at the success rate of about 20%. But it's not only that, it's actually the pace of change. And there's remarkable differences between the first part of our Federation, that first half century, and what's occurred in the 70 or more years since. Because we haven't had any successful referendums at all since 1977. So that's 45 years since Australia's, Australians voted yes to anything. And on that occasion, it was a referendum put on, there are three referendums that succeeded on that day, put by Malcolm Fraser. And they did a range of momentous things, including setting a retirement age of 70 for High Court judges, uh, which for the benefit of hindsight was probably not a good idea in the first place. So if you wanted to find someone who had voted yes in a referendum, we're well, looking at someone who's at least 63 years of age. A couple of generations have passed in Australia since we had a successful vote. And not only that, it's not just the last time we voted yes, but the pace of attempting change is slowing, and it's slowing quite markedly. If you look at the period since 1999, it's been 23 years since we had any referendum put. That's the longest period in our history. The last period that came close was 21 years between 1946 and, and the 1967 referendum. That was the period between a change on those occasions. If you look at putting any proposal at all, we've had at least one referendum every decade until the 2000s. So the 2000s were the first time in our history we had not a single referendum. And not only that, we repeated it in the next decade, the 2010s, not a single referendum was put. So if you look at that record of 44 referendums, averaging a referendum every two to three years, it says a lot that not a single one has been put for 23 years in Australia. 
When you also look at the record of who succeeded and who's failed, it's fair to say the Australian Labor Party has got the lion's share of failed referendums. They've put more than half. 25 out of 44 <coughs> referendums have been put by Labor, and they've had one success only in 1946. So we're looking at three quarters of a century since Labor got up a referendum, and all up that referendum by the Chifley government, its single solitary success, gives Labor a 4% success rate in referendums. By contrast, the Conservative parties, the non-Labor parties, have put seven of 19 proposals. They've got a success rate of coming close to 40%. So still relatively low, not 50%. But that pessimism attached to Labor explains why, particularly with The Voice, some people such as Noel Pearson have argued so strongly that he would like the coalition to put the referendum rather than Labor. Now the fact that Australians have voted so often and so fervently no in referendums is not of course necessarily a problem. I mean the fact Australians have voted no may simply indicate good sense, may indicate wisdom on their part. It may also indicate perhaps a contrariness on their part. And on occasion I've wondered if the way to improve our recommended re 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 referendum record is simply to reverse the question, perhaps asking, do you vote, do you not support this proposal? Everyone can vote no, the proposal would get up through a double negative and people could be as contrary as they wanted. But the fact that Australians vote no is in part a reflection of the poor proposals that have been put on many occasions. And to be frank, the very poor political management that we've seen from our leaders in referendums. It's striking that people who have proven to be so electorally successful have often proven to be so inept at winning referendums, such as Bob Hawke in 1984 or Labor in 1988 in putting the most unsuccessful referendums in our history. What we've had then is a record that, even though it demonstrates wisdom, even though it demonstrates common sense on the part of many votes, in my view, it's also very problematic that we've failed so often in changing our constitution. If nothing else, we've got to ask, how have we spent so much money and invested so much political capital and so much time in 36 failed proposals? And we're talking here at many, many hundreds of millions of dollars over an extended period of time. And how is it that our leaders have had such a tin ear in so repeatedly putting proposals that the people have so soundly rejected. Those are large political and other problems that raise questions about the management of our referendums. The record's also problematic because, to be frank, the Constitution does need to change and adapt. The framers developed a Constitution with a referendum mechanism because they knew it needed to change with the times. It needed to be updated to make sure it served the needs of the modern community. And the fact that the pace has got slower just as the need has risen for change, is deeply problematic in a number of areas. And here I'm not talking about those push-button issues like the Republic, Indigenous reform and the like, but often it's bread and butter issues. For me, for example, one of the biggest referendum challenges is to deliver a constitution that supports an efficient federation, supports not buck-passing but actually collaboration between the different tiers of government. When the Business Council of Australia looked at a broken federal system, they saw the Constitution as one of the main barriers to actually delivering economic growth and prosperity for Australians. They identified that it's over $1,000 that Australians pay per family per year in wasted tax. They also identified the fact that hospitals and schools are operating at a lower quality because our federal system gets in the way of delivering the best services. But even that gross inefficiency, the wasted billions of dollars in tax because of the broken system, greatly underestimates the impact of the Constitution when it comes to a dysfunctional federal system. The Business Council estimated that all up it's about $20 billion a year, and these are figures a decade or more ago, that we lose just through inefficiency of buck passing, duplication or the like. It amounts to about 10% of all government revenue that we waste through the structure of our federation. And every year our, three, our GDP is about 3% lower because of our federal system. So I look at those stats of the Business Council, and there are many examples of this kind, and I say, well, these are clear examples of where our system needs to adapt, needs to improve, so if nothing else, taxpayers' money is spent more wisely and spent more efficiently in delivering community services. So my own view is that we have a constitution that has been stable, by and large, served us well, but we do need updating and we need a referendum mechanism that will work. 
And as someone who supports the voice, who supports the idea of Indigenous recognition in the Constitution, I would like a referendum system that can support a vote with a realistic and good prospect of success. So what I want to do today in thinking about the voice and thinking about referendums is focus on three things. I want to talk a bit about how we hold a referendum. I mean, it's been a long time between drinks when we've had a referendum. So what is the path that the voice needs to follow to actually get to the people? I then want to talk about how we're going to run the referendum. What are the rules? And they're sadly out of date, and that itself is a major impediment to success in a referendum. And the third issue is, what does the record say about winning a referendum? What can we learn from those past mistakes? And if you were to adopt a political strategy for The Voice, what does that record tell you about your best chances of success? So the first thing, the basics. I mean, how do we actually change the constitution and where does a referendum fit in? Our constitution, when drafted in the 1890s, was very unusual for its overt democratic character. Rather than leaving things, as in the US, to a vote of Congress or the states, we invested the people with the sole power of amending our constitution. So hence section 128 of the constitution says that it shall not be altered except in the way set out in the constitution. The first thing we need is we need a proposal passed by both Houses of Parliament or one House twice. Now, nobody's been brave enough to try the one House twice method of putting a proposal to the people, but it is open to a government if it wanted to try it. But every proposal must be initiated through Parliament, and that's a major and important step itself. If nothing else, it colours every proposal as being a politician's proposal. It emanates from our politicians. We don't have citizens-initiated referendum. We don't have anything by which the states can generate proposals. The only way is through the politicians in the federal parliament. And the second step is that it goes to the people. It's passed at a referendum, and there we need a majority of the people as a whole and a majority of the people in a majority of the states. So a national majority and four out of six states might vote yes. And that character, the fact that we need a majority of states, reveals the other key aspect of our referendum mechanism. It's democratic and it's federal. It is deliberately designed to prioritise the voting intentions of the small states by giving them the capacity to veto. So three small states are enough to defeat a referendum, and we've had referendums that have got in the 60% of the national vote, and they have failed, because perhaps Tasmania, Queensland and South Australia have voted no. And indeed, if you wanted to defeat a referendum like The Voice, you would likely put enormous resources in Tasmania and a couple of other states that you felt were more likely to vote no at a referendum, and you may actually ignore, in some cases, mass campaigning in states that you felt were more expensive and perhaps more difficult, actually, to convince of a no vote. Now, the federal character is also emphasised by the fact that some referendums can't pass unless individual states also vote yes. So if we wanted, for example, to abolish a state like Tasmania or to change its boundaries or to reduce its number of senators, Tasmania would have to agree. So we've actually locked into our system that if we want to single out a state for special and negative treatment, that state must agree. It's one reason why it's theoretically possible, but practically impossible to ever abolish the states in Australia. You need every single state to vote yes, including those states who have a vested self-interest in maintaining states or their particular advantages. Now, once a referendum proposal has gone through Parliament, the Constitution says it shall be submitted to the people. It's mandatory, it's directive. But in fact, there have been instances where that hasn't happened. Uh, and the best example is the last time in Australia we came close to a referendum, and that was in 2013. Both houses passed a proposal to recognise local government in the Constitution by permitting federal funding of local government. And on that occasion, that directive, it shall be submitted to the people, was just ignored. <coughs> we never have a referendum, even though the Constitution demanded it, even though both houses had supported it. And the reason is that Julia Gillard was deposed by Kevin Rudd, he brought forward the election date and they found they didn't have enough time. And that or for other reasons, they essentially did not have a referendum they were otherwise compelled to have. But that's the process. Parliament, the people, and we have the double majority requirement. Now the rules for actually running a referendum in Australia and for running the voice referendum are set down in the Referendum Machinery Act. Even though I've described what the Constitution says, enormous leeway is left to Parliament as to how the referendum is actually going to be run. 
And that's because the Constitution says the rules, the referendum, shall be taken in such a manner as the Parliament prescribes. And uh, that means things like who can vote, when we vote, are we going to have pre-poll voting? All of those things are open for Parliament to determine. The Referendum Machinery Act at the moment uh, says things such as it is the duty of every elector to vote at a referendum, a normal system we're, we're familiar with for general elections. But you could introduce voluntary voting. It's quite possible to do that. And indeed, some scholars have suggested that if you want to win more referendums, the best way of doing so is make it voluntary. That many people vote no, they're frustrated having been to turn up at the ballot box, and if you left it to the enthusiastic people, yes or no, you'd be more likely to actually succeed at a referendum. And that is a possible change to the, to the Referendum Machinery Act. Not one I support, but one that a number of people have put forward. Now, the rules in the Referendum Machinery Act for the voice referendum uh, are woefully out of date. In fact, it's one of the oldest statutes on the statute book. And if you look at the rules, they were the best that the Australian Parliament could come up with in 1912. And many of those rules can be traced back to that time and they have not been amended since. So hence, if you ask how Australians are to get information about the voice referendum, the answer is, is there's going to be a printed pamphlet that has 2,000 word cases, it'll be posted to them in their mailbox, they will read it and then vote. There's no mention of electronic dissemination. In fact, these rules were written not just before uh, television, but before radio. I mean, that's how old these rules are. And there's no mention of the internet, no mention of social media or any of these more recent campaigning issues. So we have a system based upon 2,000 word yes and no printed statements that, to be frank, almost nobody reads. Uh, when I was involved in the Republic referendum and asking my students about that at the time, they'd all got their pamphlets. These were constitutional law students who I thought would be particularly interested in the pamphlet. I took a poll of my 150 students in 1999 and not one said they had read the pamphlet from beginning to end. In fact, many said they were completely unaware of the pamphlet and if they had received it, had promptly thrown it in the bin because they thought it was some sort of mass marketing mail of some kind. But that's it. That's what the legislation provides, a very expensive but very ineffective way of educating the community. Now, not only is it printed, but it only covers yes and no cases. There is no provision at all for neutral information to explain the proposal, to put it in context. And so one of the reasons referendum campaigns are so hard to win is there's fervent yes, there's fervent no, but there's nothing in the middle. There's nothing to actually explain the basics to people of how the system works and how the proposal fits in. We did change these rules temporarily for the Republic in 1999, so we had other changes like some neutral advertising, <coughs> but that was a one-off change. And in fact, that lapsed after the referendum, and quite unhelpfully, the legislation then reverted to its largely 1912 state in describing the rules for the referendum. So one of the early tasks for The Voice is update the rules and provide a set of rules that can actually work for this referendum. If you look at other aspects of that legislation to give you a sense of just how out of date it is, if you look through as to how it manages problems and things, it's quite eloquent in dealing with disorderly public meetings, but again, does not deal with the social media or other problems we might be concerned about. It also prevents the Commonwealth from spending money on the advocacy for the referendum, so it can't spend money on yes or no cases cannot spend money on that neutral educative material. Again, the Republic referendum changed this temporarily. And what's happened in past referendums is the Commonwealth has run the campaign with one arm tied behind mm. its back, and then a rich state, which has been not in any way constrained with being able to spend money, has spent bucket loads of money on a no case. And that's one of the reasons that many have failed. Joe Bielke peterson for example, very effective in spending state money to defeat some proposals while the Commonwealth was prohibited from spending a single cent itself to combat that expenditure. And again, it's hard to imagine a system that is more problematic than a lot of these rules for running a referendum. So what I'm trying to convey to you here is what we have is referendum machinery legislation that not only is old, outdated, inadequate, but it's actually not even well drafted to provide a level and fair playing field or to educate Australians with the neutral, credible information they need to assess the yes and no arguments to make up their minds. In changing this legislation, which for me is an early priority, 
we need to avoid the mistake of what happened in 2013, because these same arguments applied to the local government referendum in 2013. And what happened then was the changes were left to late in the day, after the parties had agreed, we support this proposal, we want to move forward. But then suddenly they had to put through the change to the Referendum Machinery Act, and bipartisanship broke down. They agreed on the proposal but could not agree on the changes to the referendum machinery legislation and suddenly what appeared to be bipartisanship broke down, it fractured. And there's a key lesson here for the voice referendum and that is don't work out the rules of the referendum while you're also campaigning for yes and no. You've got to do it beforehand, you've got to have some space and you've got to do it in a way ideally not just for this referendum but rules that are fair for the future. But that experience in 2013 is a very salutary lesson. And if we're going to have a referendum on The Voice as early as May next year, the clock is ticking right now to get that legislation in shape. Because frankly, there is not long before we shift into a more overt campaigning mode. And that is not the time to be saying, what are the rules <coughs> for the campaign and doing so simultaneously? Now, the good news about the Referendum Machinery Act is that there's been lots of inquiries. Um, this is not rocket science. People have identified these problems over a long period of time. Uh, one inquiry in 2009, chaired by Mark Dreyfus, our new Attorney General, identified many of these issues. But even more recently, there was a constitutional reform and referendums inquiry run by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs. And it delivered a report on the very ineffective date of 21 December last year, just before Christmas, and in doing so, it set out a range of things that would fix these problems. This was a committee that was chaired by Coalition MP Andrew Wallace. It was a bipartisan, cross-party proposal that said this is what we need to fix these issues. And it raised issues around public awareness campaigns, how we deal with the funding issue, how we deal with yes and no cases, how we get ed educational material to Australians. And it set out the full list of things that we need to do. And the simplest thing for the government to do is adopt that bipartisan inquiry, bring it into place. It's already got the support of now the opposition, at least it did at that time, and that will be the right way, in my view, of moving forward. Now the last and the third and the last thing I want to focus on is what does the record say about actually winning one of these campaigns? What do we learn from these 44 referendums that we've held in the past? And this is something that some years ago through the book that's been mentioned, People Power, the History and the Future of the Referendum in Australia, I went through all of those polls uh, with my co-author David Hume and asked what went right, what went wrong, what did we learn? And the first thing we learned was don't underestimate the capacity of our leaders to make exactly the same mistakes time and time again. And it's part of the problem with referendums. It means that they're so infrequent, particularly recently, that often you don't have the lived experience. You don't have many prime ministers running a few referendums and learning from their mistakes, particularly in more recent times. And that may be one of the challenges for The Voice. I mean, who is it within the government has lived experience of winning or losing a referendum? Within the bureaucracy, how many people have had experience of running a poll and how to run one successfully for the government? Enough time has passed, particularly since the last successful referendum in 1977, that we almost have no experience of these things. And that itself plays into the capacity to make the same mistakes that we've made in the past. One thing I would say about the record, though, is we need to be cautious. And I'll go through the lessons that we derive from that record. But we need to be cautious, because 23 years is a long time since the last poll. It may be that some of the old rules about referendum success and failure just don't hold anymore. Maybe things like social media have upended the game in terms of how we should understand what we need to convince Australians to vote yes or no. In some cases, it might make it easier to get the message out through social media. There are more channels to reach people. On the other hand, misinformation is at a much higher level in many areas. Maybe it's easier to spoil a campaign than it was. But the first lesson that we derive for how to win a referendum and what the record tells us is that it's really hard, in some cases, some people would say impossible, to win a referendum without cross-party support or bipartisanship. And that's just a function of the record itself. No one has won a referendum without bipartisanship. In fact, some polls have been lost even with bipartisanship. And one of the things you can run into even with bipartisanship is it leads Australians to think if the major parties agree, it's got to be problematic because it's got to be self-serving, it's got to be something that serves the interests of the politicians. 
So it shows some of the difficulties in this area that without bipartisanship it's hard, with it it's still hard in some instances. And by part, bipartisanship, it's not just getting the federal parties on side. Many referendums have been defeated by a party at the state level, using its funding, uh, generating votes in three small states, and it may be lacking bipartisanship, let's say the coalition or other parties in three small states, that itself can be enough to lose a referendum. Now, a good example of just how difficult it is, even with bipartisanship, was the second proposal put in 1967. And people remember the famous important Indigenous referendum put that year that meant that the Commonwealth can make laws for Indigenous peoples, they can be counted in calculating seats and the like. But the second proposal was about changing the nexus between the House of Representatives and the Senate, severing the idea that one has to be related to the size of the other. That was supported by the big parties, it was the focus of the campaign, and it failed, dismally, on the basis that the no more politicians slogan was brutally effective. And what's interesting about, if you look at the newspapers the next day, the headline in a number of the newspapers is referendum fails, because people were so fixed on that nexus proposal, it was the big proposal, not the indigenous proposal, but of course in the many years since we've rightly come to focus on the other proposal as being much, much more significant. In Menzies' view, bipartisanship was so important, and he lost, of course, on that basis in 51, that he said his loss in that year is further proof of the fact, demonstrated in every previous referendum in our history, that no amendment to the Commonwealth Constitution can be carried if the parliamentary opposition is against it. And the real challenge for voice campaigners is if they cannot get bipartisanship, can they avoid the doom that Menzies spelled out on this occasion, that he saw it as impossible? Now, my own view with the voice referendum today is that it's possible it could be won if it lacks bipartisanship, but gee, it's a lot, lot harder in that case. And you'd have to say that the chances of success are dramatically lower if we do not have broad cross-party support and bipartisanship. And it suggests on the part of the government that its political strategy needs to be directed to getting that support if possible. I mean, there are lines, of course, it cannot cross, but it would be difficult to win a referendum unless... Peter Dutton and the coalition is prepared to support it. Now the second lesson that we take from winning or losing a referendum is that you really need popular ownership. And many referendums have been defeated on the basis that they're politicians' proposals. You only need to think of the Republic referendum in 1999, vote no to the politicians' republic, a really effective tagline that's been rolled out in many, many refer referendums to devastating effect. As I said, one of the challenges with referendums is they're all politicians' proposals. They all start in Parliament. They're all championed by our politicians in those two houses. So the real challenge, including for The Voice, is how do we turn that process into something that actually has community buy-in, that actually has a sense that this is generated by people who are not politicians and is not self-serving for the political class of Australia. Now, the 67 referendum for Indigenous peoples was a classic example. It was a grassroots proposal that the government almost had to be dragged towards actually supporting in 67, and that played strongly in favour of the proposal. And the fact that the government often wasn't overly interested in campaigning for it was, again, a big plus, I suspect, in the minds of many people. So here the challenge with The Voice is, is how can the process from here de-emphasise that this, this is a Labor referendum or a coalition referendum or a political referendum how can it actually be put in a way that makes clear it's a people's referendum? And there are processes, there are committees, there are community groups, sometimes conventions that can do that, but it's really hard to actually defeat that perception in many cases. The third challenge for any referendum is popular education. And another one of the really common arguments that defeats a referendum is don't know, vote no. And that was one of the primary arguments put, for example, in the preamble, no case, in 1999. I remember uh, talking to Peter Andron as he was drafting that case, and he just put that up front. Don't know, vote no. And he said it was licensed to someone who doesn't know much about the Constitution. Just stop reading and vote no. And it's surprisingly effective in these campaigns. And it's effective because many Australians don't know much about the Constitution. Many Australians probably don't even want to go to the ballot box to be compelled to vote. Many Australians are perhaps confused by the arguments, the absence of educative material, the yes and no cases creates confusion, uncertainty, anxiety in some cases, and the familiar, somewhat comforting idea, if you don't know it's okay just to be negative, 
can be really effective in referendum campaigns. And to give you a sense of how little Australians often know, there was a poll taken some years ago which asked Australians, do we have a written constitution? And 47% said no. So that's a pretty low base. I mean, hopefully it's better than that today. Another poll I've seen taken in the last couple of years repeatedly is asking Australians, do we have a National Bill of Rights? And consistently it's about 60% say, yes, we have a National Bill of Rights. So when you're dealing with issues like the voice, about justice, Indigenous empowerment and the like, and Australians may not know we've got a constitution, but know we've got a National Bill of Rights, that's a really difficult field upon which to argue the proposition. And particularly for a no case, very useful to exploit that to actually lend itself to a no case. So the case is often put that uh, if you really want to win a referendum, you've got to give people enough information. They're comfortable, they can cast an informed vote, and it's dangerous, in fact, just to leave it with those partisan yes and no cases. Now, the last thing I'd put forward to say what you need to actually win a referendum is you need a sound and sensible proposal. And in many ways it should go without saying, but many of the proposals we've put have had flaws. Many of them simply revealed the desire of Canberra, the Commonwealth, to aggregate extra power. In fact, you could almost say most referendums are really about the Commonwealth trying to get more power at the expense of the states. And those have tended to be deeply unpopular. <coughs> The states themselves campaign against, with the Commonwealth tying its arm behind its back. It can't even argue for its own proposal by using funding. But there are others like the Republic, which had what many saw as a flawed dismissal mechanism. And when you're dealing with a big yes-no vote, it's often very easy to turn positive sentiment into a no vote by saying you may be a Republican, but this just isn't safe. This will be in the Constitution for 50, 100 years. And indeed, with the voice, that will be one of the challenges. Can they say it's safe, it's sensible, it's well drafted? And I think the wording released by the Prime Minister is an excellent start on that accord, but details and other things may be problematic, as we're already seeing. But even the smallest change, if it's seen as problematic, can be exploited into a much larger argument. It's just safe to vote no. So getting the model right, making sure it's tested, making sure people are behind it, is critical that you don't open up those fronts. So to draw it to a close, if we look at the record, if we look at the record in light of the voice proposal, our first referendum in nearly a quarter century, my own reading of the record is that if you ask why our record is so diabolical, it's for very good reason. We've tended to put proposals that have not had the support of many parties, often only the government parties. We've put proposals that people have felt serve political interests and not their own. We've put proposals that people didn't understand and felt safer in voting no, and people have often rejected proposals that they felt had flaws. And that can explain every single one of the 36 proposals that have not been accepted by the people. Every single one has one, if not all, of those problems. On the other hand, it means, for The Voice, if we can have a proposal that does have broad political support, a proposal the community understands, they feel they own, they have a connection to, and is well drafted, the record doesn't suggest failure, it actually says yes, the path to victory. These referendums can be won if actually they're put in the right way that understands what Australians would like to vote for. So my own view is I look at the record and say it's poor for a reason. And the challenge for those who support a voice, the challenge for the Albanese government is to learn from that record, learn from the mistakes repeatedly made in the past, and actually to put a proposal that people can get behind of all political persuasions in a way, actually, that the people can see this is a needed, necessary proposal and something they think they can safely vote yes for. Thank you. Many thanks. So, um, many thanks to George Williams for a very comprehensive analysis. So, um, I'll just start off. Um, Labor gets the last one referendum proposal. Labor succeeded in 1946. I think it was essentially an offer to the electorate if you voted for it, you'd get welfare payments. I think yeah. that's probably fair. And then take us back to 67. You've covered this, but uh, you know, but some people don't probably don't recall that there was no, no case on the Indigenous questions that were asked. There was on the Nexus questions. So does a no formal no case make a big difference? And you made the point about Peter Andron where there was a no case there although I think you said to me earlier it was only one person. So what's the importance of a no case in bringing about a negative result? Just come back here. Yeah. 
So yes, Australia's sole referendum of success was in 1946, and that was a proposal to vote yes so that people could be given old age pensions and other welfare benefits. <laughs> and uh, as you can imagine, many people saw that not just serving politicians, but serving them, and they voted yes. But not only that, um, Menzies' as opposition leader supported it. It's the only time ever Labor has secured bipartisan support for a referendum support. It's also their only success ever. And interestingly, Labor achieved that buy-in from the opposition because Menzies moved an amendment in Parliament, so I'm not happy with your proposal, you need to amend it. And Labor had the wisdom on that occasion to accept the amendment and the Coalition was brought in, or the Liberal Party was brought in on that occasion and then supported it through to polling day. So it suggested a political strategy of actually compromise was effective on that occasion. But yes, no cases. As you've said, Gerard, in 1967 there wasn't a no case. And the rules are that if any parliamentarian votes no in Parliament, there will be a no case. Even one is enough. So 20, sorry, 1999, Peter Andron on the preamble is a good example. He was the only one that voted no. Um, Labor, I think, otherwise abstained. And I remember him ringing me up and saying, I've got to draft this no case. Any ideas? Because it was his job to draft the 2,000 words which were going to be sent to the Australian electorate. I think, I think the reality is that whenever there's a no case, it's obviously much, much harder. Um, and it doesn't actually matter that much how large the no case is in some cases. Many of the no <coughs> cases that have succeeded have been small insurgent campaigns with just a few people, actually. And the 67 Nexus referendum is a good example of that. They succeeded not because there were many of them, but because they had that no more politicians argument. Very effective, devastatingly effective. So if you've got the right arguments and you've got a platform from a no case, every household getting a pamphlet they don't read, then that's a, a platform to argue. And here you would say almost certainly there will be a no case. Um, you'd expect One Nation, for example, to be likely to vote no. There's big political incentives for some parties to do that because they'll be up in lights. I mean, there's national vote. They can really galvanise their own constituencies if they align with a no vote. So that's going to be a big challenge. 67 Indigenous, no no case at all. There will be a no case, I think, on this occasion. And again, it says there's an order of difficulty higher on this occasion than there was in that 67 referendum. So before we move on, in relation to, in relation to funding, I guess the issue with funding is determined by the legislation. So what would be the likelihood of both cases being funded or would one case be funded to a greater extent than another case? And at the moment the, the legislation says you can fund the Electoral Commission but yes you can't fund a yes or a no case or anything otherwise educational about the proposal so they would need to amend that. They did that in 99. You had the 25 million dollars roughly for the, the yes and the no cases. But as to how that is funded, that's up to Parliament. But it is Parliament so it's not, a, it's not an executive, it's not a prime ministerial decision. It has to go through both houses. You would normally expect, you might say, that if there's funding, it would be 50-50. That's one option. But in 2013, the proposal was that the funding would be allocated according to the percentage of parliamentarians who voted yes and no. So let's say 90% vote yes, well, 90% of the funding goes to yes, because that's a reflection of the parliamentary vote. But that's where the bipartisanship broke down. And that's, in the end, one of the reasons why that referendum was never put because the coalition started to get cold feet because of the rules and people like Peter Reith and others came out of the woodwork and started to work up a good no campaign, almost largely based upon the fairness of the rules rather than the proposal itself. So, Gerard, it's really in the hands of Parliament and I think the only other thing I'd say is it's a tr strategic decision because it's possible that uh, the government might say, let's not give any funding on this occasion. There'll be too much pressure to do it 50-50 and if you feel as if a yes case is in a stronger winning position, why give the no case a leg up? I mean, why wouldn't you just let the yes case use its resources? They may be much larger than the no case. So it may actually be the government says, let's just leave things as they are on this, rather than funding a no case with even a small budget may be quite effective. So we go there, then we come here, yeah? Oh, thanks, George. This was a great, great talk. Um, I look back on the... Uh, the uh, Republic referendum, for which I was in favour. Mm. Um, and I see this one as in a similar fashion. I see a problem with the model. In, um, in the referendum for um, a Republic, the whole thing was shot to ribbons 
partly by Peter Reith, but partly by the fact that there was a dispute over the model. What would it be? What would it look like? Again, it was power over the people. In this case, we've now got an argument already. What's it about? What's the model? And the Republicans still have a problem. They can't find a model. How important will it be in this case with the voice to have a model that doesn't cause an enormous amount of dispute? And I think a, a, a good lesson from any failed referendums is the more you talk about the model, the less likely you are to win. And, uh, and the more people like me as a constitutional lawyer is out there being interviewed, the more trouble you're in too. Because, of course, it's complicated. It's difficult. People get worried. They turn off because they're not interested in the complexity. And so with the Republic, the, the challenge always for a Republic, and I'm a Republican, is that there are lots of changes that have to be made. The Queen is inserted in so many places. So there were 69 changes they looked at in 1999. And there is no simple way of doing that. There are changes throughout. And then, of course, you had not only the complexity issue, but the fact that uh, some people wanted direct election, some people wanted other forms of election, or the parliamentary appointment that we had. And I supported that referendum. I think it was the right thing to support it. But it was a tough sell, particularly, of course, with the Prime Minister who was opposed, and that was another, another key issue. The Australian Republican movement has since put out a new model, which I think is a good start to the next conversation we have on these issues. Um, but in the end, for Matt Thistleswaite, who is our new Parliamentary Secretary or Assistant <coughs> Minister in that area, his task will be to move away from models and to sell people on the idea. And if you look at 67, um, I mean, one of the virtues but also the problems with the 67 Indigenous referendum was nobody talked about the model, but also they got it completely wrong what they were voting for as a result. I mean, you've still got the myths that that's when Indigenous people got the vote. They didn't get the vote. The myth that was about citizenship. No, they didn't get citizenship. They're already citizens. So that really tugged at the heartstrings and people voted for actually something that didn't happen in many occasions. But it was very successful that that actually occurred. Now, the last thing I'd say about the voice referendum is it has the distinct advantage over the Republic in that it is pretty simple what they're proposing. I mean, the Prime Minister suggested three sentence change. I think that's one sentence too many. I think they can get it to two sentences. And there will be issues about how much follow on detail. But I think the right approach is to say there will be a voice to Parliament uh, and to the executive. And otherwise, Parliament has the sovereignty and the capacity to set down the rules for how that will work and Parliament can change it from time to time. Um, and I know there will be calls for more and more detail, but in the end, I think Parliament should have an ongoing say. I don't think that should be put in the Constitution. Just, Question to, follow here. Up, just to follow up, but the problem already is, <coughs> people are saying, what is the model? And we've already got a dispute as to mm. what it's going to look like. And if people start to think that they don't know what they're voting for, that's a negative thing. It is, and, and this again shows why referendums are so hard in part, because the Constitution isn't about inserting the detail, of course, because the model is there shall be a voice and Parliament shall determine how it operates. What's the voice? And, and all we would know, but it's enough, it should be enough in this occasion if we look at how other aspects of the Constitution work, is the voice is a body that is advisory, no veto, it's not a third chamber. Its sole task is a group of Indigenous people who will provide advice to Parliament and Government on matters relating to Indigenous peoples. But that's all, that's all it does. It's, it's very limited. There is no greater power there. It doesn't morph into an ATSIC or other things. But if you want to defeat a referendum, you always ask for more detail. But it's a slippery slope for the government because in the end it would be for Parliament to determine. And if the government started releasing detail, well, people will start fighting about that um, because there will be a vigorous parliamentary debate about those things. There's no, there's no winning strategy to say we do or we don't. You've got to make a call. And either way, you're going to take heat. Either way, and I think personally there's likely to be less heat this way than trying to fully develop a model now, which will just lead to a range of issues that, again, we'll get to our complexity issues and we won't have anything simple anymore. It'll all be about these other questions. Um, George, unfortunately, of course, there is a model, and mm. that's at it. Mm. And that's going to be, in my view, one of the, most, uh, one of the greatest impediments to um, the boys getting up. Um, what if you, what's your feelings on that? Well, first I think you should tell us what ATSIC was. Yes. Okay. So, so ATSIC was the, uh, the body that was abolished by the Howard government with the support of Mark Latham as opposition leader about 20 years ago. And ATSIC was a body that was responsible for service <coughs> delivery, particularly in Indigenous communities. It was an elected body with regional and other membership. 
and it was a body brought into being, particularly by the Hawke government, designed to provide self-government, self-empowerment of Indigenous peoples. Um, and if we were to have such a body again, that would be up to Parliament to create, but the voice can't be that body. And the, the reason is because the wording that is proposed says that the voice will make representations to Parliament and the executive government, but that's it. It's not suggesting, it, not saying it can do service delivery and other things. It's quite limited in the wording. And if you wanted another attic, you'd need to word that differently. But to tell you the truth, you, you don't need a constitutional change. You can just enact it again anyway. I mean, ATSIC was done without a constitutional change. There's nothing to prevent another ATSIC, but it's not what the voice is. It has a limited and different role. So there's a question down there. Sorry, I'll get around. Okay, just hang on a sec. Just speak into the microphone. No, right here. You you spoke earlier at the about the mechanism of a majority of people plus a majority of states. Would you mind just explaining what happens to the electors in the various territories, their views? And until 1977, the people in the territories didn't get a vote at all. Um, and what they do now is get half the vote, effectively, of everyone else. So if you live in the ACT, Northern Territory or the like, your vote is counted to the national majority, which you've got to get a 50% plus, but there is no separate territory calculation for a majority of states. So you get a national majority count, but it's not counted in that second part of the equation. So you're effectively disenfranchised. You get half the power of the vote of other people. And, but it's hard to fix that. You wouldn't want to add, I think, the territories in as equivalent of states. That would be a different and more difficult barrier. And as I've said often in the Northern Territory, if they want to fix that, they should become a state. Then they will count. There'll be seven states, and you'll need four of seven. But at the moment, territories just don't count as much as the states. This week, sorry, this week, Lydia Thorpe and Pauline Hanson, have they already made it the huge political issue and will probably destroy it by their conduct? And, and we'll see. I mean, I, I think it's, it's early days. It's early days. And for me, the challenge is that I think the campaign is starting in a good place. Overall, the polling is strong. The, they have a, a, a simpler model as they're likely to get. I think also the voice as a concept is a very strong one. You know, it, it resonates, the idea of a voice, and it has strong support in many quarters, but it's not unanimous. It was never going to be unanimous. And, and the real question is, can the government design a mechanism that will build support or maintain support over time in the face of those types of issues? Because the normal trajectory is start high and go low. Menzies is the best example, 80% plus down to 49% he lost. But almost all of them start with the best intentions, great hopes, good polling. But you don't start a referendum unless you think you've, you've got a chance with good polling. Go, can the government design a process, instead of going here, that actually either goes up or at least sideways in the face of those attacks? And, and for me, the key thing that needs to be done to achieve that is that the government probably almost needs to take a step back. It should not be a Labor referendum. It should be the people's referendum. They should have a process that involves people from broad political interests, that are seen as representative of the community, looking at the model and recommending that to Parliament, in a, that gives comfort and confidence to people that you know it's not just run by the political class, that it's got buy-in. And for me, that's the best way of responding to political attacks. Remove it from that realm and actually design a more popular <coughs> community-based process. Um, because I think unless we do that, and if it just becomes a fight on the floor of Parliament, then those arguments will resonate quite strongly. Question. There. Speaking to the microphone. Yes. Um, so just to um, come back to the issue of ATSIC, um, if, if the voice is to be um, simply a, um, a body whose, uh, whose opinions are to be presented to the parliament and to the executive, um, but which in itself has no greater power than simply to, to put an opinion, um, wouldn't it be simpler to, to simply create a bureaucratic body um, along the lines of ATSIC, created by Parliament um, and, at the, uh, you know, and at the whim of Parliament, so to speak? Um, isn't that going to be the argument which is, um, w which is put, which is, well, if it's, got no intent, if it's got no purpose and no power, why are we changing the Constitution when we could simply have one anyway? 
Yeah, and I, I think the main response to that is that the voice is designed to do something different to ATSIC, and, and it's a and it's a difference that means that they. Yeah, no, no, that's right. right. But in terms of why and how, um, I mean, it comes back to the Uluru Statement itself five years ago, and the problem identified there was that Indigenous peoples over the life of our nation have not had a say, um, as they might on the laws and policies that affect them, that are made by Parliament, but also policies made by the Executive. And that missing voice, the participation in that process, um, explains both many of the poor economic life and other outcomes, not completely, but in part, and the aspiration is, is to have influence and agency in that process. So that when laws are made, that let's say a law dealing with the stolen generations or dealing with issues in the Northern Territory, which relate directly to Indigenous peoples, that there's a body there that can say, from our community perspective, we see these problems or these positivities, we think you should take this into account. So it's deliberately focused on the parliamentary and executive policy and lawmaking process. It's not about service delivery. And the argument is that this should be in the Constitution because when we have done like things, they are in the Constitution. Um, there are other bodies that do like things in that document. And it also gives a level of certainty to the body. It's part of the apparatus, part of the system of government that puts it beyond the power of any one government to abolish. But it will have some permanence, which that community has identified as being necessary and important to give them the say and empowerment that they're seeking. There's a question here. Yes, I'd just like to ask a question about the, you talking about the rule of the referendum. And you say there's a problem because your student, most of your students didn't mm -hmm. even uh, bother to read the, uh, the information they, they, they received. So um, if that's the case, the, uh, what about in the parliament? Like, you know, I, my understanding in uh, parliament or in the senator, when they pass the legislation, I don't think, I mean, how you can guarantee every politician actually read the registration because some of these registration have probably 500 pages. Thank you. Well, and, and certainly the student, when I asked the students why they didn't read the yes and no cases, they said they were really dull from the problem. And I mean, look, if, I mean, how many people want to read 4,000 words, just words? I mean, I would be happy to read it, but I'm a lawyer. But to be frank, most Australians just aren't interested enough to sit down to read 4,000 words dealing with these issues, no pictures. And, and, and if you think about how we communicate and actually people take information, visuals, for example, are critical. They're really important. The layout was really awful. And there's all these things that say, if you wanted a document that looked mind-numbingly dull, well, we have that in our referendum pamphlet for both the yes and the no cases. Um, and the other thing that they said really turned them off is they said it was so partisan, it was just yes and no. And a lot of them said, I want to learn about the proposal but I want to make up my own mind. It's just hitting me with slogan, yes, slogan, no, slogan, yes, slogan, no. And they felt it was a real turn off. Um, so that, they were reasons for them, quite interesting reasons, I found, from people studying constitutional law who themselves felt a bit alienated from this document and didn't feel the need to read it. But in terms of reading things generally, yes, you make a point. I mean, the volume of legislation we pass is beyond the capacity of any parliamentarian to read, let alone the regulations, let alone to understand the intricacies of that. So. Hence, the system we have is based upon advisors and the like, because the volume is ju it's just not possible for any person to get across. You said that there were other elements in the Constitution that work the same way. What would you say? Uh, other elements in terms of like the voice you're yes. saying? or. Um, so in terms of other elements, I mean, what we have is, of course, we have, I mean, the three arms of government, a part of it, you've got the executive, you've got the parliament, and you've got the judiciary all set there in terms of playing a role in the making, interpretation, application of laws. So one reason the voice would be there is because it's an adjunct to parliament. It's an advisory body that works into that. There's also another body, the Interstate Commission, which is meant to provide advice but hasn't actually existed for a long period of time. But the framers put it there because they felt a body of this kind deserves to be in the Constitution. So there are examples, but equally, of course, there are examples outside Parliament too. I'd acknowledge that. Productivity Commission and other bodies. There are many bodies that bear upon these decisions. But the argument is that the voice is special. It's important because of the significance of Indigenous peoples within our community, their history within which they have been the subject of so many discriminatory and other laws. And if you look at the racist power in our constitution, which permits laws to be made against the interests of races, Indigenous people are the only group that federal parliament has ever targeted for negative racist laws under that power. 
So they have a legion of examples to say the system has not worked, we need to balance it out, our voice needs to be heard, and the Constitution is the right place to put that. Does that include immigration law? Uh, well, the immigration laws we've had were not actually passed on a race base. So we had the White Australia policy, which required a dictation test, but it never mentioned people on the basis of a particular race. So the only race we have done that with is actually Indigenous people. So even if you look at our original voting legislation, it disenfranchised uh, Indigenous peoples at that time, but no other race was mentioned. Um, so yes, we have many immigration laws that have been applied in ways that have affected races, but the wording of the law was not drafted that way. Interestingly, Parliament used proxies like a dictation test, which were perhaps thought to be more palatable for doing that, rather than singling out people from particular communities. The, um, the just briefly, the other politician you mentioned who's, who was very popular in 1977 was Malcolm Fraser, and he won a huge uh, election victory at the end of that year. So what, what happened there? Well, Malcolm Fraser is the nation's most successful referendum campaigner. Um, we've had eight successes and he won three of them. And he won three of them on one day in, uh, in 1977. Uh, and if you look at what he did, um, he followed good basic principles. There were conventions, he had bipartisan support. Um, they were worked through the states as well, so he had the states on board. Um, the proposals were pretty simple as well. They didn't excite a lot of interest. And I look at those referendums and say, even though we're fixed on big issues today, the voice, the republic and things like that, for me, a lot of the agendas are about bread and butter things, to do just fixing things in the constitution that are broken, like the federal system that I mentioned. And I hope we can, at some point, get to fix those things, as Fraser himself did, in a, in a starting way in 77. So that included territories being able to vote in referendums. Pretty simple, retirement age of 70 for High Court judges, maybe not such a good idea, but popular at the time. Uh, and that was, they weren't ground earth-breaking proposals, but they were successful. But he lost the only one he wanted. That's right, he lost one. He lost only one on that occasion, but he got three up. So 75%, that's a good record for any Prime Minister. I've got a question here on Zoom. Is the voice little more than symbolism? Can't, can't the executive and parliament just ignore the voice, even if the referendum is successful? Well, yes, they can. Um, and in the end, the, the voice clearly, according to the wording, can make representations. But Parliament will receive those representations, but Parliament could decide not to take that advice. There's no fetter on Parliament to pass whatever laws it wishes, or the executive to make whatever policies it wishes. But um, if you look at other countries and how these things work out, there will be political power involved in having a voice, Indigenous peoples, who speak from their community, particularly if they're elected, and put their view on legislation affecting them. It will change the political debate, it will educate people about their view, and it will have an impact, I believe. But that's a political impact, it's not a legal one. There's no veto, no third chamber, but it will change the course of debate in these areas. That, that's, that's the impact. And even though I'm a lawyer, I often say, I mean, law is often far less significant than just political process. That's often what makes a difference in this country, and this will change the political process. And I think there's a question here from someone who might want to become a member of the George Williams fan club. It is, do you think that the parliament will listen to your advice in preparing this referendum? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope so, because, I mean, I want to see the voice succeed. Um, I do think the constitution should contain this mechanism so that Indigenous peoples are heard in the making of laws that affect them. I also think we're poorer for the fact that our constitution doesn't mention Indigenous peoples at all. And if you read the preamble to our constitution, it's as if our history started in 1788. There's just nothing prior to that. And I think that's a problem. I look at my kids, for example, in primary and high school and the education they're getting. I'd like a constitution that resonates, that actually educates about that, that helps us to be proud about that history. So I'd like to see it, but I also say as someone who thinks referendums should work, I'd like to see a referendum get up because I think there's a lot of things in this country we should tackle. Um, there's unfinished business and other provisions like the Federation, and I think we need to show we can do this so we can move on to some other important things as well. And finally, I know lawyers are very cautious people, but if you came back in in a year, what do you think the result would be? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm genuinely hopeful. I, I, I think, I mean, as I say, the big unknown is the political strategy that the government adopts. That's the big unknown. And, as I say, whether we start here and end here or whether we go down like those other 36 referendums, 
My view is, and this is a big caveat, if the government adopts a proposal that builds broad political support, engages the community, I think the referendum can and will be won. But if the government adopts a strategy that divides or doesn't do that and follows other paths, then we have a well-known path to follow. But I'm hopeful, I'm an optimist about this, and I think the government has started off in the right way. George Williams, many thanks. Thank you. So we're, we're right on time, and I'll be very brief. Uh, many thanks to Professor Williams. It was a, a great analysis. We know where our speaker stands on the issue, but you've given us a lot of objective and detailed advice about the past and the current likely referendum and what will happen. So we're very grateful to, for this. It's a, it's a terrific uh, analysis of just what happens and has happened and may happen in the future. So for tonight, well done, and we'll have you back sometime. Thank, Thank you. you.